You wonderfully gave a presentation at Chautauqua Institution, of which I was a participant for two of the three days, and unfortunately law got in the way after the third, and you left me hanging. You left me hanging with the question about the integration of Negro League Baseball. Well, Major League Baseball, yeah. Well, actually, of organized baseball, as yeah. I said back then, because it included the majors and the affiliated minors. Yeah. But at, so at one point, there was a, uh, a white guy who played in the Negro Leagues. Yeah, there were a couple. Um, they were just gate attractions, um, the same way the women who played in the 50s were gate attractions. Mm -hmm. They were signed by teams looking to boost the gate. Um, the, they weren't very good players, the white guys. The women in the 50s weren't very good players either, but you can't tell that from the um, hoopla and the hype around them. I'm not saying they weren't brave. I mean, these people were pioneers. Anyone who's a pioneer is generally pretty brave, but that doesn't mean you can play ball. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I don't really know much about him. One of them was named Eddie Clem. Yep. There's uh, Chuck Brodsky, a baseball singer-songwriter who does a lot of baseball stuff. He wrote a ballad about Eddie Clem. favorite one of his songs. My favorite is his ballad about Richie Allen uh, being a Phillies fan when he was growing up. He 
the opening line is, you and me, we never booed Richie Allen, you know? And I, it's just a wonderfully sweet song about youth and ba being a baseball fan and about racism. And uh, I think the song's name is Letters in the Dirt. Well, there is a guy, I, I read a little bit about him, Cleveland Buckeyes, and a promoter brought him on, and, uh, and he had a really sordid past from Erie, Pennsylvania. As much as I know about Eddie Klepp. Right. And, I, I said Clem, didn't know Eddie Klepp, yeah. Yeah. And uh, Larry Gerlach wrote a photo on piece about him. But, oh, yeah? But he, he was from Erie, Erie, Pennsylvania. Uh, so here we are in Hampton. There's Pratt. always a quarterback in every project, but it's you. Well, you know, it, it, it's more by default. It's more by default. Um, in 2014, the foremost expert on the Detroit Stars and Negroes in Detroit died. Great guy, Dick Clark, Sabre member. Yep. Uh, his one of his good friends, who probably knew more about the Detroit Stars than anyone else beside Dick, died a few years later. And so somebody had to answer the questions, and I sort of default was defaulted into that role. And as far as Ham Tramick goes, um, I was the one who sort of rediscovered the history here. There are only a few old timers. I mean, old timers like 80s, 90s, who remembered that the Negro Leagues had played here. And um, when I saw an editorial advocating tearing down the grandstand, I didn't even know what the name had been in the day. It had been called Ham Tramick Stadium. It had just been called the Grandstand in Veterans Park by, this, by the 2000s. I went to the mayor and said that, well, I'm not a Ham Tramick resident and not even a Detroit native, although I live in Detroit now. I said, but somebody should know the history before you make a decision to tear it down. Mm -hmm. And that's where it started. And then it always helps that I'm incredibly stubborn. You know, um, my wife and I uh, credit much of our success in terms of staying married to each other is just simply being stubborn, too stubborn to give up. <laughs> you know, so I'm well, st stubborn and I'm willing to spend a lot of time on something I care about. Yeah. So, just to uh, up, what's your background? I misspent youth. Um, I grew up in northeastern Pennsylvania in the Poconos, went to Michigan State University. Uh, I was not an athlete, uh, although I was obviously not. Um, I was young and thin then. Um, they recruited me because I was National Merit Scholar. They recruited me for scholarship, uh, an academic scholarship. And then uh, I stayed in Lansing, worked for the state legislature until I left and started my own business. And then in the early 80s, I got introduced to Bill James and started uh, working on projects that he was working on. Most Saber metrics. Yeah, I mean, I, a friend of mine and I were doing our own research to do a baseball simulation game, and I got introduced to somebody who worked for the Texas Rangers at the time, and then to Bill James. And then when Bill started Project Scoresheet in 1984, I got involved immediately. And when the project was incorporated in 85 as a nonprofit, I was on the original board of directors. I was one of only two people who were on the board of directors from its inception in 85 until its demise in 1990. Uh, so, um, and you know, I figured out in a year or two that this was more fun than working for a living. So I decided to do baseball as a profession. And I have to say, it's been a lot of fun. Um, not necessarily very rewarding. I'm sure I could have. All that time I spent on baseball, I could have made more money elsewhere. But, you know, it, it's, it's been incredibly fascinating to me. And it's been rewarding for the friendships and the, uh, the connections I've made. And occasionally it pays serious money. It pays cash or beaver pelts. <laughs> one, of, one of the lines in uh, Jeremiah Johnson, the Robert Redford movie, was about cash or beaver pelts. Yeah. So. You, though, are well known in the Society of American Baseball Research for many things, but really Negro League Baseball, you become a, an expert at it. You know, was there an aha moment where you sort of cast a, a drift into that area? Well, yeah, I guess it was in um, 2010 when I decided to get behind, well, to start an effort to save Andrew Stadium. Actually, I wasn't getting behind anyone. I was joined by two people early on who became co-founders of the Friends of Historic Camp Traffic Stadium with me in 2012, but at that time I was solo 
I mean, before that, I was co-chair of the Sabre Ballparks Committee, and so I was a ballparks expert. And before that, I was co-chair of the Business of Baseball Committee, so I was a Business of Baseball and Baseball Economics expert. But really, it's just, um, you know, I'm an autodidact. I, I went to college and studied English and philosophy, amongst other things like astronomy and racial and ethnic studies, and I just sort of drifted into doing what I wanted rather than having any career plan. So. Larry Lester and those guys who were involved in the early days of uh, Negro League Baseball just gathering facts because it wasn't that long ago where very little was really statistically known about it. Yeah, about just 50 years ago was the start of modern Negro League scholarship with Robert Peterson's Only the Ball Was White. I mean, prior to that there had been no book-length history of the Negro Leagues since 1907. I mean, that, and that was the only one prior to the 1970. Saul White? Yeah, I saw White's uh, book about colored baseball. Hello. Hey, let's get it. Players. Yeah. Well, this is what the field is here for. It's a community field. We've already had many people proposing to fence it off and to control access. They could sell tickets, and I'm saying you can. Well, city council will, will tell you whether you can do it or not. I'll tell you, I'm going to oppose it. Uh, to my mind, this is a community field, and the happiest I would be is when I see kids out here playing pickup soccer, or they used to play pickup cricket in the outfield. Oh, yeah. Until the city of Detroit decided to create two first-rate cricket grounds north of here, about a mile north of here, and so all the cricket activity moved up there. Yeah. But we still have an occasional cricket uh, match here. We had one in uh, June, in mid-June. Um, We've had a lacrosse coach out here trying to teach uh, kids lacrosse, the fundamental lacrosse. We've had um, softball on the field. You know, we're trying to get as many community activities and as many non-baseball activities as possible. So, have traffic. Uh, you come out here your first day, you look at it, what do you think? <laughs> Here we are in Hamtrek, Michigan. I hope I'm saying that right. And one of uh, the few remaining Negro League ballparks still here. This was built in 1930. It housed the Detroit Stars. And if you can look around me, it has seen better days. Uh, we still have the covered grandstand above us, but we have a giant fence right in front of uh, the home plate seats and shrubbery. This is not the place you want to visit. These uh, floor panels are not that sturdy. You might fall down, and there's all sorts of debris and alcohol and graffiti around here. Uh, but this is where we are right now with a classic old grandstand that, you know, to be honest with you, you probably can see some better days with a little TLC because you still got the field out there. Let's take more look around this place. Classic covered grandstand. It's near 4th of July. That's where Detroit FC plays, where those light towers are. But unfortunately, you got this. Literally got to watch yourself where you walk here, because if you don't take a look, you're going to fall straight down and uh, hurt yourself. So, like I said, these panels are not that sturdy, and a lot of them have giant holes as we can see right here so we got the grandstand above me it's blocking the light very creepy eerie place to walk around in a deserted ballpark but this is what we have here and uh, all we can say is we hope one day this place will come back to its original form and it possibly could with uh, soccer being played a few yards away and packing them in so who knows <music> Well, I mean, the standard reference sources about baseball parks had Hamtramck Stadium as being demolished, and most of them had its location being about 300 meters that direction 
where Keyworth Stadium is. Keyworth Stadium there is a current home of Detroit City Football Club, which is, uh, I guess, I don't know what they call it in professional soccer. I would call it a Class AAA league. It's one level below Major League Soccer. Uh, at that time, they were, uh, for many years, they were really a semi-pro club, but they've moved up in the pecking order um, recently. Somebody somewhere along the line conflated Hamtramck Stadium with Keyworth Stadium. Keyworth Stadium was opened in 1936 as a high school football stadium and it was a big deal in Hamtramck because A, it was built with WPA money and that meant a lot of unemployed Hamtramck men could get jobs working building Keyworth Stadium and back then a decent job could feed a family of four or six, you know. And so it was a very big deal that these unemployed men in Hamtramck uh, were put to work. Second, Franklin Delano Roosevelt came here to uh, attend the grand opening in Keyworth here. Stadium. Yeah, well, not here, but Keyworth Stadium well, over okay. there. Okay, yeah. But Hamtramck, yeah, there's pictures of him in his uh, open top, um, you know, limousine. I don't know if you call them a limousine, they were these big touring cars, these yeah, yeah. big ass touring cars. So somehow people had conflated the history of Hamtramck Stadium with, with Keyworth Stadium. And you could find pictures in reference books uh, of Hamtramck Stadium, and they showed the football field at Keyworth Stadium. And it never made any sense to me, because in 1930, we are in the Depression, baseball was king, pro football was, uh, was not even a third-rate sport. You know, boxing, horse racing, college football were all more, far more important than pro football. Um, and aside from that, nobody had the money during the Depression to build a new stadium uh, when you had one that was six years old, excuse me, uh, yeah, six years old, sitting next door. So I couldn't figure it out why they wouldn't have just put a gridiron on the field here. There are plenty of ballparks in the early 20th century that are built specifically for baseball mm -hmm. where they wedged a football gridiron in. Uh, and actually even up to mid-century, Memorial okay. Stadium in Baltimore, home of the Colts and the Orioles, was built for baseball. It was a terrible place to see football because past uh, I think the 40-yard line on one side, there were no seats. They were all just going out in the outfield. And, and the seats, of course, curved away from the field, yeah. even at midfield. So it didn't, didn't make any sense to me that people would trash or demolish a six-year-old ballpark to, fit, to make a high school football stadium. So I'd always been puzzled over it, but I'd never been here. So finally I noticed one night when I couldn't sleep at two or three in the morning, I was looking at reference books. I noticed that one reference book had a street grid location that would be Keyworth, and another one had a street grid location that would be here. I thought, huh, what is that? So I go on Google Earth, and I see a, a satellite picture of the top of the Hamtramck Stadium Grandstand, which is rusting away and certainly looked old enough to be 1930 vintage to me, and looked small enough to be a Negro League Park or a minor league park. Came out here a couple days later, and looked at this and said, damn, this is the real deal. That's why Keyworth never made any sense as a baseball uh, venue. And so I started researching the history further and concluded very quickly that this was the uh, remainder of Hamtramck Stadium. Hamtramck Stadium, originally built in 1930, was much larger. It seated about 9,000 people. The grandstand, which now is, uh, extends only part way down the foul lines, between first and third base and would seat in 1930s terms about 2,400 people. Uh, originally sat 9,000 people. The grandstand extended down past third base on the third base side and halfway to first base on this side because in those days the home team always sat on the third base side. Mm -hmm. And so if you didn't have the money to build a symmetrical V or U, uh, you built it on the third base side and shorted the first base side. There were bleachers on the first base side as well because the home team fans would pay to sit on the third base side, they'd pay extra. So the primo seats were the seats behind the dugout, uh, sure. the home team dugout. So it was like a reverse J, and uh, until it was reduced in size in the 1970s when the city took over maintenance from Wayne County. So I started thinking, wow, this is interesting, but I didn't think much of it um, until a year and a half or so later when the local newspaper editorialized that it should be torn down because no one was playing baseball here and no one would ever play baseball here again. So I went to the mayor and told her the history. She asked me to speak to city council. I told them the history and both were wonderfully supportive. The problem is the city of Hamtramck had no money. It was, uh, if not then under emergency financial management, it had been under emergency financial management for much of the previous decade and it had no money. 
So it was left to me to figure out how to raise the money with um, a lot of moral support and a little bit of physical support, you know, maintenance stuff from the city, but no financial support. So uh, how did you strategize that? Did you create a strategic plan? Did you have a committee? Was there a, did, you do, did you tap some of the players of the community just to let No, them? the mayor appointed a committee to save Amtramic Stadium and put me on it, and that put me in touch with many people in the city, including a preservationist who was a native of Hamtramck, Rebecca Benno Savage. And she's a professional preservationist, and she knew the ropes and said, well, first thing we need to do is get it on the National Register of Historic Places. I had no idea how much, <laughs> how much bureaucracy was involved in that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. At one point, our submission to the State Historic Preservation Commission, which had to approve it before it went to the National, was rejected because our photographs, our digital photographs, were too high resolution. Too I think, high. yeah, I think they were supposed to be two megapixel. And the photographer who took them took them at like six megapixels, and they rejected the submission because of that. So we had to redo the photographs at a lower resolution. Um, so it was very fortunate because while I knew the history and I kept researching and digging up more stuff, uh, Rebecca was the one who shepherded the application through the state approval, and then it goes and. National Park Service, which approved it. Um, and so that was the first step. That gives you a lot of moral authority. It doesn't save you from demolition because it only prohibits someone from using any federal money from, for demolition. Uh, lo uh, local funds and um, private money can be used. So, so the next step was to get a Michigan, State of Michigan historic marker, which took us about two years. Um, there's a labyrinthine process for that, but that gives you a lot of publicity, uh, which we needed. And the next step was putting together a plan, uh, and the next step was then seeking money. But the first significant grant that is more than $20,000 came in 2017. Um, you know, the state of Michigan took a long time to recover from the 2008-9 financial meltdown. There was no money in the city of Detroit, which went into bankruptcy in 2014, if I remember correctly. And there was no money in the city of Hamtramck. And so we were out there, you know, scraping for dollars. Um, but the $50,000 African American Civil Rights Grant in 2017 for the National Park Service really jump started things. That was given to the city of Hamtramck, uh, applied for by the city planner who was maybe the first city planner Hamtramck ever had and was laid off like a year and a half later. Um, and she applied for it using my research, my historical research. So you get that and now you've got a little bit of momentum. I actually think we've got a lot. I mean, the Wayne County, Michigan is solidly in our corner. The city of Hamtramck is, again, um, not much money from the city, but occasionally we get a little bit of help financially. Mostly we get help with things like maintenance issues with that. There is a new Hamtramck Parks Conservancy uh, founded in 2020 that I was on the board of for the first um, year and a half, I guess. And that Parks Conservancy had been given $2 million from the Ralph Wilson Jr. Foundation. Ralph Wilson endowed a foundation with the sale of the proceeds, the proceeds of the sale of the Buffalo Bills, which was Yep, I think a billion two at the time. And then with the stock market going up and up quickly became more like a 1.4, 1.5 billion. And the Wilson Foundation is focused on Southeast Michigan where Wilson lived until he died. He was a Gross Point resident and Western New York State where he owned the bills, Rochester and Buffalo. And so it was a tremendous benefit that Wilson Foundation um, gave $2 million to the new Hamtramck Parks Conservancy wow. Uh, of which I think about 800000 was used for the grandstand rehabilitation, yep. which cost about a little less than $3 million total, money coming from federal government funds, community development block grants, from Wayne County, from other Wayne County funds, uh, from the Kresge Foundation, the Wilson Foundation, the Detroit Tigers Foundation, and a second uh, National Park Service African American Civil Rights Grant. You were here, I saw it on YouTube, uh, just couple months ago, uh, dedicating the facility. June and, 20th, yeah. yeah, June, yeah. And uh, Ron Teasley was there and, and all that. And it was that just, tell, tell me your emotions when you got it up before the microphone and all those people. 
actually, I hate to say it, but it's true, I would just burn out. I had been working on that 15 hours a day for several weeks. Prior to that, I'd been on a trip to go to the uh, annual Negro Leagues History Conference in Alabama. Prior to that, I'd been working, burning the midnight oil on planning the event. And uh, the morning of the event, our lead speaker dropped out because he had gotten up and was sick and was worried he had COVID. This is Wayne County Executive. So he dropped out. I didn't know if we were going to have a lead speaker. And of course, um, we didn't have a professional publicity agent. Uh, I, I organized this myself with the help from my board and from the, with the help from my wife, who probably spent 100 hours in the previous month working on it. So I was just keyed up and everything I was trying to make sure that everything that went wrong could be fixed or at least could be papered over and that things just moved along because we had a Negro Leagues tribute game scheduled after the rededication ceremony and the team from Chicago was using Chicago American Giants uniforms that we paid for and had designed um, had to leave like at 4 or 4.30 so we couldn't r let the event run long uh, and so once the game started I went to our canopy down the first baseline where we were selling caps and, and that. I just sat there drinking water and uh, sort of crashing. <laughs> so I really wasn't uh, emotional about it. I am now very proud of it. But that day was just like a tremendous, tremendous anxiety until the event. When the event was over, I just sort of crashed. Okay, my name is Larry Gillette. I'm co founder of Friends of Foreign Campground Stadium, chair of the board, and we organize and are hosting this event. Today, I'm going to start the program with giving thanks to the many, many people in the institution that helped us get to this point. If you believe it takes a village to raise a child, I'll tell you that it takes federal government. The, apparently, it's not. Federal government, the county, the city. Um, many foundations and many and local nonprofits and a whole lot of love to get to this point. So now it's my great, great pleasure to introduce pioneering player and coach, native Detroiter, Negro Leaguer, uh, played in Canada, played in the Dodgers farm system, U.S. Navy veteran, photojournalist. You, you just can keep going on and on. Members of six different Hall of Fame, including the Wayne State Athletic Hall of Fame and the Afro American Sports Hall of Fame and Gallery. Ron Teasley Sr. and his family, daughter Lydia, his two sons, Ron Jr. and Phil, and his grandson, This stadium has a home in the 1930s, started playing baseball here in the West. The stadium we played here before, the back part, burned down, and uh, this is a city uh, that had tried to welcome the people of these that uh, allowed us to play here. We really appreciate that. When I was about uh, seven, eight years old, I can recall attending a game out at the stadium. But uh, I, don't, I didn't see too much of the ball game because I was under the stands until they got about looking for I don't know what. But just, anyway, I was playing in the dirt. But it, uh, <laughs> the place was. Jammed. People came here directly from church to West Park. And uh, I would just like to, uh, I think they introduced my family. I'd also like to introduce some other uh, uh, family members, like, like baseball players who go out West in high school. Uh, with you, with you, with you. Church family, they're, they're here as well. Don't <laughs> uh, we'll leave anybody out. But uh, I'd like to just remind you that uh, we should try to get behind the members to keep this uh, stadium alive and well and, 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 and 
about the what's up with Dave's and Dave's and your support and support the efforts of the I'm sorry, I've also made a comment about the National Anthem, the Star Spangled Banner, sung by Joyce Stearns Thompson, Rosalind Stearns Brown, daughters of Hall of Famer, and Underrated great player, one of the greatest players of all time, Norman Turkey Stearns, for which our field is named. It does. On Sunday, I was out here, uh, Sunday yesterday, I was out here talking to a tour group from the Detroit Historical Society about the stadium, and there was a men's senior league hardball game going on, except the seniors weren't very senior. There were some of them in their 20s. Um, but that's fine. I mean, it was great they were playing ball. They're having a good time. And one of the players commented, and someone on the tour commented, that this field was in better condition than the field at the U in Utica, Michigan, about 30 miles north of here, for the United Shore Professional Baseball League, uh, which is a professional minor league. It's not affiliated with Major League Baseball or Minor League Baseball. And I felt really good about that. We do not have subsurface drainage or sprinklers here. The, the field is watered using a water wheel, which is basically like a Jagunda lawn sprinkler you roll out and trail the hose behind it and then it whacks the little thing around and the water sprays around and originally we connected it to a fire hydrant oh. that was originally our connection was to a fire hydrant and uh, the drainage is just the way the field was built we did we did it right we hired a company in Pennsylvania that builds minor league and college high, uh, ball fields and some high school fields and they did it to the spec that you would get for a low minor league club yeah. and that means it drains pretty well we've had games here on days where there was torrential downpours like two days earlier and rain the previous day and all the other games in the league would be canceled but our t uh, the game that's scheduled for our field went on. So yeah it's a really good field. The infield's in great shape. It's maintained by the Hamtramck Stadium grounds crew which is a volunteer group that became somewhat internationally famous. I mean they had stories on the BBC and National Public Radio when they um, cut down all the weeds and um, restored the Tiger Stadium field that was literally eight feet uh, with weeds eight feet tall covering it after Tiger Stadium was demolished and made it a community park even though they were trespassing and the city of Detroit threatened times to arrest them and they kept doing it they became somewhat famous for their grit and their determination and after they were chased off the site when the city of Detroit redeveloped it for the Detroit Police Athletic League headquarters 
they came here and we welcomed them and they maintain the field. Uh, they're great guys. We pay all their expenses, but they still volunteer labor. And I'll tell you, I would not want to be out here at 7 a.m. on a Sunday morning cutting the grass because there's a tournament starting at 9 o'clock, yeah. tournament game, and there's practice starting at 8 o'clock. But they do that, and we're grateful for their work. And they have a, a nice following on Twitter and Facebook. Dave Mesry? Dave Mesry's involved, yeah. Tom Derry was the founder. Tom, yeah, Tom Derry. Tom yep. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it's been a great team. Um, it, it's hard to imagine all this could come together. I, when I did the June 20th thing, I limited myself to like three minutes of introductory remarks. And I said, if it takes a village to raise a child, which I believe it does, some people don't, it takes a community to save a ballpark. And that community involved our nonprofit, the nonprofit, uh, Hamtramck Stadium grounds crew, the non-profit Hamtramck Parks Conservancy, although they are a very late entry and really didn't have much to do with the um, grandstand except funneling the Wilson Foundation money. Private foundations, Wilson and Kresge, Major League Baseball team, the Tigers Foundation, the National Park Service, the State Historic Preservation um, Board in Lansing, uh, City of Hamtramck, if I didn't mention them, Wayne County, Michigan, which not only directed federal funds here, they managed a construction project, saving, I would guess, $150,000 in construction management fees, and also making sure everything was done right and done so this would be a community asset. Um, so we had a huge number of people involved, and it took, well, it took um, 12 years after I started working on it for the grandstand to be rehabilitated. We did re restore the field in 2020, so only 10 years on that. So the history, the history, Hamtramck is a, started off as a Negro League ballpark. It was built for the Negro League Detroit Stars, Negro National League Detroit Stars in 1930, uh, after the Stars were chased out of their previous home on the east side of Detroit by racist neighbors who hired a lawyer and petitioned city council to prohibit them from rebuilding a grandstand that had burned down. Mm. Now, the, most of the information on the web will tell you the Mack Park burned down, was demolished, but it wasn't. Uh, only one grandstand burned, there were three, and there were also bleacher seating. But it was the primary grandstand behind on plate where the swells sat, they probably paid a dollar or something. And so it was the only one with chairs, and it was very important. But um, they demolished the grandstand. The arson investigation was concluded within 48 hours, and the Detroit Stars played a makeup doubleheader with the Kansas City Monarchs there three days after the fire. However, the owner of the Detroit Stars had to agree to leave the site at the end of the year in order to get permission to play there the rest of the year, and he couldn't make it economically without rebuilding that grandstand. So he found a site in Hamtramck. Most of this land here was uh, the site of a, a not abandoned, a closed lumber company yard where they had a planing mill. There were railroad sidings going through the, the what is now the field. There was a railroad siding take, that would take coal to a coal company just to the west of our site. And he leased the land during the Depression for a song and built the ballpark. Detroit Stars? Detroit Stars in 1930. The Stars had been chartered or founded in 1919, charter members of the Negro National League in 1920. But in 1931, at the end of the year, they folded along with the Negro National League. Now, that was not exceptional. Several Major League Baseball teams went bankrupt during the Depression, and um, tons of minor league teams folded, and leagues went bankrupt. The minor leagues by the start of World War II were a, sh uh, a shell of their former self before the Depression. So uh, the Negro Le National League folded. In 1932, a new league, the East-West League, was founded and a Detroit Wolves team played here. Mm. Five, five future Hall of Famers, including uh, Smokey Joe Williams, who some think was as good as Satchel Paige, including Willie Wells, who's probably the greatest and most underrated Negro League player uh, that people haven't heard of. They've heard of Buck Leonard, Josh Gibson, Oscar Charleston, Satchel Paige. Many have heard of Smokey Joe uh, Williams. Some have heard of um, other guys like Pop Lloyd. But Willie Wells, not really well known, was a great, great player. And um, also Mule Suttles, Ray Brown, and Cool Papa Bell. Cool Papa Bell is one of the most famous Negro League players. 
he is a great and a Hall of Famer. He's not, you know, up in the top ten in my view of the greatest Negro League players. But with that nickname and with all the legends about his speed, mm -hmm. his legendary speed, he, he is very well known. So they all played here for half the year. The team folded, the league folded. 1933, the Indianapolis ABCs uh, moved here as part of the formation of the second Negro National League. They lasted one year. They rebranded themselves the Detroit Stars. In 1937, the Negro American League was founded to rival the Negro, second Negro National League, and they placed a club in Detroit, which was not a very strong club. It was a former semi-pro team called the Titus Detroit Giants, who brought back Turkey Stearns, who was in the twilight of his career but was a great player and a gate attraction and one or two other former Negro Leaguers and they played very bad ball until they folded at the end of 37. That was the last time a major Negro League team called Detroit or Hamtramck home. In the 40s there were some exhibition, not exhibition games, there were neutral site league games at Briggs Stadium um, where like the Kansas City Monarchs would come in on a Sunday and play like the Baltimore Eli Giants uh, with Satchel Page pitching, they might draw 30,000, but they could only play when the Tigers out of town mm -hmm. and they could only play limited games because it wasn't their home ballpark. It was what they called a neutral site game. No, it saw lots of action, but it, uh, it was originally one of the attractions to the City Hamtramck for letting this ballpark be built and for also resisting racist white people who wanted to the city to not give a, a permit for building it and not give a lease to the Negro League um, team owner was that um, the city would get a free venue for prep sports. Uh, high, their high school baseball team, their high school football team played here for six years until Keyword Stadium was built uh, for soccer and for community events. And from 1930 until it was closed in 1997, it was the locus for high school baseball, not just the Hamtramck High School team, but also Hamtramck had two Catholic high schools and both had baseball teams and they played here was also semi-pro baseball, semi-pro football, occasional soccer game, um, uh, outdoor boxing matches, which back then were very popular, um, and um, American Legion baseball. They built in the 40s um, Little League and softball diamonds in the corners of the outfield, left, right, and center. They had 60-foot diamonds, uh, as you know, uh, high school and major leagues and professional used 90-foot diamonds. They built three 60-foot diamonds, one in each corner in the outfield, and the one in center field, which faced home plate here, so it was oriented 180 degrees uh, different, was the home field of the 1959 Little League World Series champions. Just going to ask about that. Yep, and these the, guys played here. Yep, they played here. You can see, you can still see if you walk out there, the remnants of the diamond, and there are still two light towers out there. Now, of course, they won the World Series in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, where the World Series is always played, but that was their home field. I'll be there. And uh, the player who was our star hitter and pitcher was Art Pinky Darris. He just died a couple months ago. Uh, Art was a great guy. He um, is considered by uh, Little League historians as the greatest Little Leaguer ever. Yeah, there was a documentary on him. There was, in fact. Uh, I think it was called Pinky Darris, uh, the greatest Little Leaguer ever. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, can, you can find it. I don't know if it's streaming now. I, I bought the last DVD copies I could find so I could have a copy to, to you know, lend to people. Part of your research, of course, delves into the Negro League baseball generally, and it draws specifically to Detroit, but as you get into that, do you at times uh, feel the ghost of a, like a Robert Peterson saying, Gary, go, team, go? I don't. I don't feel that. I never thought, I, I, I love Shoeless Joe the book. I didn't really like the movie, Feel the Dreams. Um, but I always felt conscious of the fact that I was um, building on a legacy that other people had built up. Robert Peterson, John Holway, who did invaluable oral histories in the 70s and 80s, Jim Riley, who put out the Biographical Encyclopedia of the Negro Baseball League in 94, which was a 900-page book without which for 20 years until a lot of this stuff showed up on the web. Nobody would have known much about most of these players. I mean, the star players people would have. Um, it had more than 3,400 entries. Um, and then the Sabre Negro Lease Committee, uh, Larry Lester, Dick Clark, who were instrumental for decades in building this. Um, Ted Knorr from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, who started the first 
Negro Leagues Conference, uh, the Jerry Malloy Conference, was named for another Negro League scholar, uh, Sabre member. The Jerry Malloy has been held annually since the late 90s, uh, minus several years where it was canceled, part, two of them for the pandemic. Um, and uh, all these people were there before me, and all these people built up a platform from which I could do my research. Plus the fact that so many newspapers are online now, it saves me so much time. You know, going to the library or borrowing microfilm is just a tremendous uh, time sink. And you're always wondering what you missed if you don't look at every page of the paper, but that takes so much time, you default to just looking at the sports pages, but there could be a sports story on page two that you miss. Sure. And so the fact that so many papers are online now, both Metropolitan Dailies, who in some cities covered the Negro Leagues well and others didn't. Um, in Detroit, it was hit and miss. The Detroit News sometimes covered Negro Leagues very well. They covered the 1930 grand opening in Frank State very well. The Detroit Free Press sometimes covered it better, sometimes not at all. The Detroit Times, the third paper, the, the Hearst paper, um, rarely covered the Negro Leagues here, but they but occasionally you find some nugget of information that the Detroit Times published that the other two papers didn't. Mostly it was the African American papers, the Chicago Defender, Pittsburgh Courier primarily, but also others. They were all weeklies. Uh, and when I started this research, only four of them were available online. Now there are 11, mm -hmm. including the Michigan Chronicle, which would have been extremely valuable, except that it wasn't founded until 36. And that was, um, of course, six years into the Negro Leagues run in Hamtramck. And then there are no known copies to exist until like 1940 or 41. So for my Negro League research in Amtramek, the Chronicle essentially is, is not helpful. But, um, uh, well, as you know, I mean, just having small town papers online, the Olean uh, Times Herald has information on the uh, uh, debut and the dismissal, the release of two Negro League players from Detroit, Sammy G and Ron Teasley, who played for the Olean Oilers in the Dodgers farm system in 1948. They were playing pretty well by all accounts, and they were released before midseason because according to the owner of the team, they were determined not to be a prospect. I think that's a bunch of horse hockey, um, but without going to the Olean paper, you wouldn't even have that. Um, and so it just, um, turbocharge research. There's so much more research being done because of so much is available digitized. I found uh, an article in the Jamestown paper uh, which Satchel Page came in 1954 and his star first baseman was Mr. G. Yeah. Sammy um, was, it's considered by some people here, the greatest high school athlete Detroit Public Schools ever produced. And that's saying a lot because they produce a lot of, of professional ball players, particularly uh, NBA players, um, but uh, Sammy Wood was uh, a star softball player. I believe he's in the uh, he is in the softball Hall of Fame. Uh, he was good enough to be signed by the Dodgers, even if he was unfairly cut loose too short. Um, he played in the Negro Leagues for the New York Cubans in '48 briefly. Uh, he also played, I believe, football and basketball. I mean, a lot of these guys. I mean, back then, people played three or four sports if they were good enough, yeah. and some of these guys were good enough. You didn't specialize, partly because the salary was so low. You, if you could play two or three sports, you could make a lot more money. As you indicated a little bit earlier, you're standing on the shoulders of an awful lot of research from Robert Peterson forward, and you listed a whole lot, a whole lot of them. But as you have read their research and doing your own, what's the misimpression people may have gotten by reading if they read just the first couple and what the current thinking is, uh, current scholarship, if you will, on Negro League Baseball. It's, what's the one or two things that say that's what's really changed or been enlightened? Um, I don't think there were any macro level um, mistakes made in the research by the, the Titan researchers. There are plenty of amateur researchers who would look at one article, talk to one person, and then print something that was hyperbolic or that was inaccurate. Um, I think the, the guys that I named all did solid research and they got some of the stuff wrong. Um, newspapers um, sometimes print the wrong facts. 
-hmm. Sometimes a newspaper will have a source that's got an ax to grind and they won't reveal it or it won't be revealed and someone 40, 50, 60 years later won't understand that. Um, a lot of the facts were lost to history until you could find like um, not just the Detroit side of the story but the Kansas City side of the story. So a researcher looking at microfilm in Detroit, if he couldn't get access to microfilm from Kansas City about the first night baseball games in Michigan history in 1930 when the Kansas City Monarchs came here and played the Detroit Stars and Hamtramck, would have the Detroit side of the story and maybe if he was diligent would check the Chicago Defender and maybe even the Pittsburgh Courier, but wouldn't have the Kansas City end of the story. And so um, I think that from the beginning most serious Negro League researchers knew they were major leaguers. Uh, it's hard not to when you know once baseball integrated you have guys who played in the Negro Leagues, started in the Negro Leagues, Hank Aaron, Willie Mays, Ernie Banks, Monty Irvin, all of whom are Hall of Famers, Willie Mays, some people would argue the greatest player in baseball history. I would argue he's in the top five and in heavily into the conversation about who is the greatest player of all time. Um, and the National League for 20 years after integration was dominated by black stars. I'm not even mentioning guys like Willie McCovey and Bob Gibson and Roy Campanella and Jack Robinson. I mean, it's just astonishing. So if segregation had continued, these guys would have played in the Negro Leagues. How could you say they weren't major leagues? Now, the Negro Leagues suffered from many, many drawbacks, um, shaky financing, uh, really grueling travel. They travel more like minor league teams did uh, in those years, not like major league teams. Um, discrimination in terms of dates, if they played in a minor league ballpark that was owned or controlled by a white team or even a major league ballpark, they got only the dates that the team was out of town and they might uh, not be able to play on a Sunday when they could have turned out a big crowd. They might have been bumped for a rain out for the white club. Um, they had thin rosters, typically 14, 15 guys, so they didn't have a lot of depth. Um, the, the team owners did not have deep pockets in many cases, so if they ran into trouble, the clubs folded. Uh, it was a tough, a tough haul, but they were major leagues, and Major League Baseball finally did the right thing in December of 2020 by saying they were major leagues. Unfortunately, Major League Baseball laid an egg by saying they were elevating them to major league status, which caused more than a little backlash from the people who said, hey, the, the people who studied Negro League history and the families of the Negro Leaguers said, hey, our father, our grandfather, our brother always knew they were major league. He just figured it out. Yeah. There are only four Negro Leaguers who played in the major Negro Leagues from 1920 to 1948, still alive. Ron Teasley, our friend, being one of them. Uh, Willie Mays being one of the other three. There are two others still alive. Really? Yeah, there were only, oh. there were only four in December of 2020 when um, uh, the Major League Baseball made that announcement, there are still four. Hopefully there'll be four for quite a few years longer, but I mean, these guys are getting up in age. Uh, Willie Mays is, uh, I believe, 92 now. I believe that's right, uh, maybe 91. Um, Ron Teasley is 95. I don't know how old uh, Greason or Golden are, but they're, certainly they're eight. They're wet, they're well up in their years, and uh, it's uh, it's a good thing that a few of them got to see the uh, status uh, elevation, as Major League Baseball called it. It'd be a better thing if Major League Baseball finally does what they promised in December of 2020 and integrate the rule books. So you'll see Josh Gibson's name in the rule books and Oscar Charleston and Turkey Stearns and. Jo um, Satchel Page. Right now, they're still not in the rule book. Or not, I said the rule book, the uh, record books. The record books. Yeah. The guy that was, uh, of course, notable was Minnie Minoso. Uh, Minnie, and he finally got in the Hall of Fame. Unfortunately, just like Ron Santo and so many of the other guys, Dick Allen will get in soon, probably, after his death. A, a true tragedy. Because Minoso really, in addition to a great ball player, Minoso was, in fact, a pioneer. He. He should be given credit as being the pioneer Afro-Latino player that is credited to Roberto Clemente. And I'm not dissing Clemente. Clemente was a great player, suffered a lot of discrimination, and was a pioneer. But the first prominent Afro-Latino player who blazed the trail was Minnie Minoso. Uh, when you do interviews like this, what's the question people often ask you that I have yet to ask you? 
Oh, I don't know. Actually, I think you've asked a lot of them. They asked me how I got into this, um, you know, what I want to do for the future of the stadium. We have, right now, we still have three masonry buildings, uh, brick, concrete, block, or brick, that are um, just used for storage. They need to be rehabilitated. We have the money to turn one of them into bathrooms and locker rooms, which is great. It should happen sometime next year. We still need concessions, uh, security office, first aid, and a small exhibit area where we can put indoor historical exhibits. The Friends are going to put outdoor historical and interpretive exhibits here either later this year or early next year, but we need an indoor exhibit space. Um, in addition, we're planning on starting a Turkey Stearns Classic using African American and minority high school ball players next year. We'd like to make that an annual event. We're hoping the Tigers will become sponsors. Um, and I just want to see the field utilized every day. Uh, I told, when I spoke to Antrimic City Council the first time in 2010, it was a uh, majority Muslim at that time. Uh, it is now 100% Muslim, and the mayor of Hamtramck is a Muslim. Um, and I said to them, I know your kids, the dominant Muslim communities here are Yemeni, Bangla, Bangladeshi, and uh, Bosnian. I know your kids are soccer. They play soccer, and the Bangla kids play cricket as well. I said, I know most of them don't care about baseball. I know the Hamtramck baseball team, high school baseball team, have trouble filling out a roster. But I said, it's the history, the Negro League history and the baseball history that will bring federal and private dollars mm -hmm. to rehabilitate the stadium and to make this field here a community asset again like it used to be. Your kids can play soccer on it. We'd be glad to let them play soccer on it. It's in our budget to buy uh, an electronic soccer scoreboard. And we have had rec soccer leagues in the outfield here for years. Uh, we had cricket here for a long time until the city of Detroit lured it away with better facilities just north. We've had lacrosse um, coach here teaching kids how to play lacrosse. We did have a cricket match, uh, a coach trying to teach uh, young kids to play cricket here in June, be just before our event. Really? Yeah. So, I mean, I want this to be a community asset. I want to see concerts, picnics, you know, all sorts of stuff here, movie nights. Right now, well, there are no lights here, so we're not allowed to have nighttime events. Hopefully, we'll have the ability to do that sometime in the future. Well, you're remarkable, Gary, and I am so thrilled that you're, our paths crossed in Chautauqua Institution, and yeah, it was hopefully fun. you'll speak again sometime there. Well, I was told that the class enrollment, which was uh, 10 or 11, I thought it was 11, there were 11 bodies in the classroom the first day, but they told me it was 10 when they sent me the registration list. Uh, actually, they didn't send me the list, which is another issue. Um, the uh, I was told that was pretty good for a first-time class, so hopefully they will consider inviting me back because uh, it was fun to go there. It's a beautiful area, of course, and the people who stuck with the class, or eight people stuck with it after the first uh, session, uh, I think really enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to seeing their feedback forms. Well, it's great, and if we get you back next year during the season, we'll have you throw out a first pitch at a tarp skunk. <laughs> I have to say that when I first saw the tarp skunk name, I thought, that's a cheesy thing. Like, I don't like the Erie Sea Wolf's name. There's no, there are no wolves near Erie. It's been a long time since there were wolves in Pennsylvania. And there's no sea next to Erie. And there's no such thing as a sea wolf anyway. Um, but, but I thought the tarp skunk's name was like that. And, and your website only mentions the skunk aspect, the uh, skunks that make their home in the grandstand or in the tarps sometimes. I didn't know anything about um, Howard Emke and then manufacturing, the first manufacturer of baseball uh, infield tarps, and presumably tarp for home plate in that, was in Jamestown. And so that really made it special to me. And now I think it's a great name. <laughs> I think it's a great name. I tell people that's one of the best names, because both connections are both linked to the ballpark. Right. You know, you have, you have your own skunks. You're not timber wolves, you know, and there ain't no timber wolves yeah, there. Sure. And you have the, the historical connections, it's a great name. Oh. Of course, you know, there's always a historical uh, pull. Most baseball teams are named something that somebody else named a team in that city a long time ago that has no connection to that team other than they play in the same city. The Jammers and the, uh, but, you know, you got a good name. So, so. You. Well, you're a good guy and I appreciate your taking the time.